Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone. I am your host, Kyle, and I am joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. We have a great episode here set up for you guys. We are going to detail the Green Bay Packer game against the Washington football team, making the trip up to Green Bay, which almost seems like a trap game. Right, guys? Trap yeah. game? <laughs> yeah, this isn't a trap. It's just, you know, it got us. I know you said earlier it's like a trap season. Yeah, it's yeah. Tra- then then you retorted with it's a trap franchise. Yeah, it is. And I tried to retort and didn't have anything, so we just dead of the conversation after that. Right. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and speaking of that, the Burgundy Zone is part of Listed Frederick, a podcast network family, and you can find out more at www.listedfrederick.com. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, guys, is our fan questions. And the first one that we have is from the Colonel, and he has a, a set of them for us, and they're phenomenal questions, by the way. They so, always are. The first one I'm going to ask you is, he has the trade deadline. Are we players Who for whom? And are we dealing away anyone? Maybe Landon Collins, Brandon Sheriff. What do you think, Reed? Um, I, I don't think so. The NFL, it's weird. You, you never really see trades. It's, not, it's nothing like the MLB or the NBA, at least. Uh, it just takes too long for guys to get adjusted to teams. There's too much to learn. So I, I personally, I don't think so. I don't think there'll really be players. Um, And I, yeah, I just don't even think that people would really contact them. I don't think anybody would really want Landon Collins at this point just because of his contract and, and the way that he's been playing. But I mean, there's always a chance. I mean, when you're this bad, you gotta you gotta do something to turn it around. So hopefully, maybe. But I don't think that they will be players. I don't think they'll be players, especially not Landon Collins. Um, the way that he's been playing with the cap hit, nobody's gonna want to embrace that contract right now, especially at the position that he's playing at safety. <laughs> wink, wink. Um, <laughs> but Brandon Sheriff, obviously with the injury and obviously with his cap number being around 18 million, I don't think anyone would absorb that contract either. To be perfectly honest. And if they're going to trade for anybody, it's going to be probably a linebacker, if anything. But I, I think that they truly believe in the unit that they have and the guys they have in the room right now. I think Jamin Davis has been making strides, has been doing really well. And I think they believe in that, to be perfectly honest with you. What about you, Hall? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you guys. I don't think there will be players. You guys already mentioned the whole Landon Collins thing, like you said, the way he's been playing. And just for the simple fact of the contract, again, like you said. And at the end of the day, the only really tradable assets I would really, if you want to call them that, would be someone along that defensive line because they're so. Ooh, Hall froze. Hall froze. All there right, Reed. Freezing again. Yeah, let, Reed, let's go with the second question from the Colonel, and that is all the past comments of trusting Jack and Ron Rivera on linebackers because they were linebackers <laughs> is a crock, he says. Our stats don't lie, and we are putrid at linebacker. WTF. He has a point, Reed. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, look, Cole Holcomb's been falling out of his mind. Jamin Davis really has not been playing as bad as people make him out to. And if you don't believe me, go go to Logan Paulson's Instagram, my best friend. Of course, I've got to plug him. Uh, it's one of the best Instagrams in the game. But definitely go see him because he's he's a, he's a great friend. You know, he's, he's my best friend probably. But, um, no, go check it out. He does a great breakdown of Jamin Davis talking about him. And, and Jamin Davis, we've all kind of known he was going to be a project. I don't think we – a lot of us thought kind of jumped the gun and we're thinking about his athleticism and, and all that he brings to the table. But he only started one year in college. He, he's he's going to take some time to adapt. And every week he seems to be getting a little better. He will be okay. I think down the road you will see that, yes, they do did know what they were doing. And Jamin Davis is going to be a standout player. But, you're uh, hey, you're right. Right now, I mean, we haven't been getting that much play from the linebackers outside of Cole Holcomb. Yeah, and Cole's leading tackler on the team right now with 37. I believe he has two fumbles on the year. Um, and he's done incredibly well to that point. And I think you have a point, Colonel, and I I just think it's taking longer for the actual progression to come through with Jamin. Now, with John Bostic, I think that was just literally a physical thing where the body and the physical ability wasn't there, but the mind and mentality was. And no coaching can really benefit you in any way in that capacity you know what I mean you can't benefit that that way but with Jamin I've said this before it was almost like the way that they brought him in as a Mike linebacker instead of doing it as a Will or a Sam where it's very simplified you don't have to know all that much that way it would have been very easy to plug him in and tell him to keep his work style short 
So what they did instead of that is what they put him at mic and put everything on his plate. And what this did is it hemorrhaged the short-term success, but it prolonged the long-term success. And it just depends on how long it's going to take until that break happens. And we're slowly getting there. You're starting to see the progression there from Jamin. So I, I don't think... I don't think we need we we should be critical of the linebacking core and Jack Del Rio and coach, but I think it's a whole defense issue. To be perfectly honest with you, uh, what about you, Hall? Uh, what was the original question? Because I was kind of frozen towards the end of that or the beginning of that. <laughs> He's basically saying what WTF, WTF with all of the um, line, we, bad linebacker play and it being Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio. We talked all offseason how the linebackers should have elevated play because of the coaches being former linebackers. But coaches saying, WTF, the linebackers aren't playing well. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Cole Holcomb. Um, he's leading the, lead, leading the team in tackles. Uh, he has the interception against the Saints. Um, so I The think best mullet like, in the game, too. The yeah, best mullet in the game. Can't yeah. deny that. Um, but, again, in the perfect world, he's more of a rot rotational guy, uh, like a like a specialist, if you want to call him that, a speed guy. But, I mean, yeah, honestly, at the end of the day, uh, we thought that, like I said, Bree kind of mentioned it, we everyone thought that Jamin Davis, because they were showing the highlights of him running with Kyle Pitts and covering him at Florida and all the athletic stuff he did, the, the interception against Tennessee where he ran it back for a pick six. So everyone kind of just figured like, oh, okay, well, linebacker was a weakness. They drafted a linebacker. He was the highest rated inside linebacker. Jack and Ron, no linebackers. The front four is already great. This is a perfect fit. And you're seeing that it's kind of like the college and NFL gap. It takes a little bit of time. Like you guys mentioned, one year starter. So his snap count in the beginning of the season, I know that everybody was kind of freaking out about that. Everyone was like, oh, it's so low. He's the first run pick, blah, blah, blah. You saw last week he played 40-something snaps. He was all over the ball. I think he had double-digit tackles. So I think, yeah, like you said, as you mentioned, yeah, as you mentioned, as the season goes along, hopefully it'll start to click a little bit more and more and more and then Maybe by the last – towards the last stretch of those division games, maybe you'll see the best of Jamin Davis, and hopefully we'll get that. Right, yeah. And to be fair, we were all wrong about a lot of stuff this offseason. So. Yeah. <laughs> very true. Well, very, very true. Coach Rivera's teams typically, historically, do better later on in the season. Um, that's just how it is. And I think that's just his coaching mentality of same letting with, the – Same with Jack Del Rio. Yeah, they Second let these guys season. progress and grind through the season and get better. You can kind of see that with how they've stuck with Landon Collins uh, in that aspect. Now, the next question from the Colonel, and I'll stick with you, Hall, on this one. He said, God forbid Dak Prescott is injured and out for some time or the rest of the season. Will the Cowboys' offensive juggernaut slow down? I believe so if he's out of the lineup because they don't even have any Dalton at the backup position anymore. They have uh, Ben DiNucci. Uh, I don't Isn't that think their it's only? It's uh, uh, really Garrett good. Gilbert. Garrett Gilbert is the other yeah. backup that they have now. So uh, yeah, I do think that it would be a huge drop off. I'm not gonna say that like it won't be a juggernaut anymore. I think with those weapons on the outside and those playmakers they have in the backfield, I think that they'll still be some type of a serviceable offense. But they putting up 30 plus points a game, be a top five offense in the league? Mm. Of course not. Dak, I hate to say it, but Dak is a great quarterback. He's probably top five in the game right now. But uh, I don't think that the the injury is that serious. Obviously, it's a calf strain. Who knows how they're going to go. But, again, they have a bye week, so that's an extra week for him to rest up. And I just think that it's kind of that season where everything, for regular season-wise at mm. least, everything's kind of going right for Dallas. And everyone's thinking, oh, they're going to the top. But we all know how Dallas is when it comes, once it comes postseason. But, like I said, as a Washington fan, it pains me to say this. Dallas is actually pretty good this year. They're starting out well, um, but you know the old saying: it doesn't it doesn't matter how you start, it's how you finish. Um, and I, you could see this kind of balancing out later on in the season, depending on how injuries go for them. But I don't see them slowing down offensively. Defensively, they are playing lights out. They're flying all over the field. Uh, they're getting out to the quarterback, but they're they're playing opportunistic football. I mean, Trayvon Diggs, I mean, he's giving up big, big plays, but he's able to grab the ball. And I don't think that luck is going to continue to happen. So I, I do think they'll slow down a little bit um, offensively, but I wouldn't expect it to be by much, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, that offense, it's just so stacked. I mean, you look at the two-headed monster in the backfield with Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard, and then you just look at their wide receiver core. Like, those top three receivers are so good. They're getting production from the tight ends. Their offensive line is playing like it should. Offense, I think, will be fine. But you're right, Kyle, the defense, I mean, they – their defense has been so good. Of course, Micah Parsons is fantastic. But then you mentioned Jameis Winston. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Trayvon Diggs uh, of cornerbacks because mm -hmm. the guy, he's fantastic one second, 
And he, what he's doing right now, I will say, it's unreal. That guy is just all over the place. I've never seen somebody have interceptions like this. Like, especially, like, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes going forward. But he gives up a lot of big plays. He really does. He gave up that one against the Patriots last week. That almost cost them the game. Yeah. Um. So it, it's definitely – they their defense, I think, will – definitely come back down to earth but that offense uh, it might simmer down a little bit but they're they're that good they're very good yeah and i'll keep this with you reed last question from the colonel is what are your thoughts on taylor heineke personally he thinks he's doing well expected expected given the brutality of our schedule that said we sucked ass offensively against kansas city in the second half yeah no i mean you're 100 percent right look i don't think anybody can be disappointed with taylor heineke if you bought into this entire thing right off bat because of two good games immediately that he's the franchise quarterback and we just found ourselves the next Tony Romo or Kurt Warner then I'm sorry but that's I mean you did this to yourself he's just not he's not that right now could he be maybe I mean he's definitely shown flashes and he does good I definitely like the moxie that he has about him he has a certain cool calm demeanor that you really like in your quarterback um and he has kind of a gunslinger mentality and then that showed up and that's burned him a few times um but he it's going to be a process. Like we said, there's times where quarterbacks will go through stretches where they play good, but then defenses might catch up to them or they're just, their luck runs out. Think different things can happen. And I think you've kind of seen that with Taylor, but I also think that he knows this offense well enough and there's enough playmakers that he can get back on track and play decent. I don't definitely think he can be a solid starter for us, but I, I don't know if he's necessarily going to end up being a franchise, Tony Romo, Kurt Warner type undrafted guy. I don't think he will be. No, and I think that he's the perfect backup, the guy with a kind of chip on his shoulder. A exactly. Jeff, Gar Jeff right. Garcia type, personally. Um, I was on Andy's pod a couple weeks ago, and he asked after the Giants game, and he asked, you, <clears throat> did Taylor do enough to warrant being the quarterback of the future, the franchise quarterback? I said, no, for the season, yeah, but he has to show consistency, and that's what we haven't seen yet from Taylor. And Coach uh, said in his presser they talked to Taylor – and they wanted him to dial it back, you know, not be so aggressive like he was in the Saints game throwing those picks. So then against Kansas City, it's almost like a toddler where he took what right. they said to the extreme and did nothing and had no offensive output. And it's almost like a kid where you're like, okay, I didn't mean literally, man. I didn't mean literally just completely shut everything down, but mix it in with how you play. You know what I mean? Just don't – you don't have to force everything. Just be smart with the football. It's almost like that aspect with Taylor Heineke. But for right. the time being – I, I, I like Taylor, and he's all we got at the moment. Um, I, I know a lot of people are clamoring for Kyle Allen, but here in Washington, we typically have a fascination uh, with um, with backup quarterbacks. And when the backup quarterback comes in, doesn't do well, then we're like, okay, who's behind him? And it's just it seems like a rotation we're always doing. I want to stick with Taylor for the time being, and let's see if we can get this thing ironed out because that that was a very, very bad loss against Kansas City with a putrid defense. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really surprised. Um he is who I kind of thought he was all along, which was even going back to last year with that playoff game, which it was a guy that the league didn't really have a lot of tape on, so they didn't really know what to expect, a la the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And so when you see when he goes up against a formidable defense, as in the Chargers, the Saints, Buffalo Bills, uh, one of those higher-end defenses, one of those units has been playing together for a while that really mixes up a lot of, guy, a lot of stuff and gets exotic with their blitzes and kind of schemes. He gets really confused and not really – can't really process everything as fast as like a a starting quarterback should. I've always said that he's a really, really talented Colt McCoy on steroids type of start, right. spot start mm -hmm. quarterback that can win you some games if you need be. And he's a high-end backup that definitely deserves to be in the league, kind of a la Colt McCoy. And even he's, he, he can even be here for multiple years as a backup guy, like I said, a spot starter. As you know, Washington quarterbacks love to get injured at some point in the season, so he'll definitely get his shots. But – I definitely think that uh, once Fitz is ready to go healthy, I think they're going to go back to him. I think they should go back to him. I think that he has the more arm strength than Taylor Heineke. He processes the defenses a little bit faster than Heineke does. Obviously, Heineke's more of the playmaker with his legs. But like you said, Kyle, it's kind of like once the coaching staff says something to him through the media or maybe they're saying something in, throughout practice week and maybe in his ear in the headset, it's kind of like instead of being that – guy that plays with the moxie and that kind of swag and kind of makes uh, those off script plays. It's like, okay, well, I got to be a Alex Smith or a Tom Brady. I got to win from the pocket. And that's not right. where he really excels at at this point in his career. Maybe it gets better over time. He's not even really started a whole season in the NFL, in the NFL throughout his whole career yet. But again, me personally, I just always said that 
I like the guys that are kind of big, strong, strong arm in the pocket and can make all the throws around the field or even majority of the throws on the field. And that's just not Taylor Heineke's right. asset right now. So, and, hey, Like you said, he's a hell of a playmaker. I mean, the yeah. dude can make some incredible things happen. We've seen that multiple times already this year. It's just – yeah, can he do that consistently? I don't know. Could he get hot and do that for a few games? For sure, we um, we've seen that. But can he keep that up for an entire year? I don't know. And I could see him starting. I could see him developing and being a starter. But I I just don't see him being like the franchise guy. Mm, I can understand that completely. Thank you. Kyle, I hope so. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I hope you can. <laughs> now our next question is from our guy Paul Murphy. He wants to know how impressed have you been with Ricky Seals Jones Reed. <sighs> I love it. I, I love Ricky Seals Jones right now. Uh, I was, we were all very concerned uh, about tight end the, behind Logan Thomas. We all thought John Bates was going to be the one. People were getting obsessed with Samus Reyes and his height and his athleticism and, and his basketball background. But I thought you were going to say the picture that you took. Oh, and that, that big old thick boy that he was when he was <laughs> stretching that one time. Um, but Ricky Seals Jones, I mean, the why, former receiver. Oh, why? <laughs> these, uh, this coaching staff, uh, and you got to give it to them. They really seem to know how to pick these tight ends and see mm -hmm. something in them that nobody else seems to see because it, it happened last year with Logan Thomas. It's happening with Ricky Seals Jones. He's just a talented pass catcher who uh, he played quarterback in high school. Apparently, I didn't know that. And uh, that really helped him out That because when you're a quarterback, you know what a quarterback wants to do. So uh, I, I really think that that's helped. And he's just been unreal. I've been super impressed with him. I picked him up in two fantasy leagues so far because of injuries, and it's paid off so far. Yeah, and he's proven to be a quality starter. Uh, I've been very impressed with him, and he's even a better backup uh, once Logan Thomas comes back. That game-winning catch, uh, touchdown catch against the Giants was, was absolutely unreal. incredible. Um, and not only that, but as a blocker as well, he has really progressed and gotten a lot better at. Um, so he's really kind of progressed into this complete tight end, and it really shows you that once Logan Thomas does, does come back, this could be an offense that could be – you could say dangerous to an extent, especially in the middle of the field, given that Terry McLaurin's on the outside. We don't know what's going to go on with Curtis Samuel, obviously, but there's there's speed. There is the threat there. Ab ab absolutely. Yeah, um, you kind of hit my point that I was going to hit Kyle, which is uh, definitely surprised at what he was. I know, like, once he got signed in the offseason, we were all kind of like, okay, yeah, he's a good kind of athletic guy, but is he really going to be able, like, to really – uh? Kind of like one of those tight ends that you can disguise, like, oh, if he's on the line, you know, is it going to be a run play or is it going to be a pass play? Kind of like the Jordan Reed thing where mm. you saw Jordan Reed on the field lined up. Nine times out of ten, it was most likely a pass play. He wasn't really that good of a blocker, so people had skepticism going into it. Obviously, with like you said, with Logan Thomas going down, everyone kind of thought, like, okay, here we go again, more playmakers down. But he's definitely stepped in, did a excellent, done an excellent job so far. Uh, what does he have? Two touchdowns on the season so far, or something like that. And they're uh, both big two, touchdowns. They yeah, made long. two big, yeah. two big great touchdowns. Um, he had the lone so, touchdown last week. Yeah, exactly. The lone yeah. touchdown for the offense last week. So uh, I definitely think that once Logan comes back, they have a great one-two punch with the tight ends. Definitely going to open up the middle of the field for Logan and uh, Ricky Seals Jones. But like you said, it'll definitely hopefully open up things for Terry and that kind of intermediate between the safety and linebackers. And maybe even the downfield stuff, maybe him and Heineken can get on the same page or Fitz whenever he comes back. Get yeah, on now, the same page with that downfield stuff. Now, Hall, let's keep it with you with the next question from Paul. Who was your star performer on the O-line last week? Ooh, on the O-line? I'd probably have to go with Cornelius Lucas. I think that uh, he had a clean sheet last week, if I want to say that. PFF had him with no sacks, no hurries, no QB hits, no penalties. So any day you get a, a pretty much a zero on the scoreboard, not for the team, but as a lineman, that's a great thing to have. And hopefully he'll keep it up going forward with Cosby still being out. I don't know if – I think he's, what, out this week, I think I want to say. Question one, yep. I don't know. He, but, no, he's already out. Yeah, so hopefully he can keep it up this week going in up against uh, Preston Smith and Rashawn Gary. I know Rashawn Gary plays on the inside, but they kind of move him around. But, uh, yeah, so Cornelius Lucas for me. I think it's Wes Schweitzer, to be perfectly honest, the way he came in. Um, on the opening drive, there was a play where he just bulldozed the guy and put him on his back. He j he seems like he's not missing a beat from last season. And Ron Rivera even talked about how the violence and the physical nature that Schweitzer actually brings is reminiscent to what Sheriff does. And it almost it seems like a tra an easy transition for them. And I think it's Wes Schweitzer. I think they ran the ball incredibly well last week. Um, given the circumstances. And I think a lot of that has to do with Wes Schweitzer uh, being there. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys both took mine. I was going to give it to both of the two new guys over there starting. Well, not new, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, the backups that had to play over on the right side and really held their own and stood out, played fantastic. But I'm going to go with somebody who's really been our best offensive lineman so far this season, in my opinion, Eric Flowers. Eric Flowers mm. has just been almost dominant, especially in the run game. I mean, you know that he has the strength. He's just a big bulldozer. The guy can do it every once. He looks like the big show with pads on. And uh, he's just he's out there road grading people. And I mean, you've seen it multiple times. That guy delivers at least two or three pretty big blocks per game in the run game. Pass protection, he's looked fine too. This transition to offensive guard has really done wonders for his career because he'd be out of the league already if he didn't make this switch. Yeah, and that's a really, really solid point by you. Um, and then he, Paul, I know. Paul Murphy wanted to finish it off because we also asked for score predictions. And I'm going to tell everyone score predictions at the end, but because Paul asked the question, uh, his score for this weekend is going to be 27 to 24 with the MVP being blew it with a field goal winner to end it, which seems to be a common theme. Uh, yeah. oh, he has us getting the upset, I see. I like that. Yeah. I've, can I just say that even if blew it, blew it, like blows it a, a lot, uh, I hope that we just keep him around forever just because of his last name. That's like having a quarterback with the last name pick six or something, or like yeah, a six. linebacker oh, yeah. with the last name doesn't know how to fill his gap and really struggles in zone coverage or something, you know, like doesn't <laughs> like <laughs> – it's a perfect last name for a kicker. Yeah, and now our next question is from our boy Scott Hartley in the UK, and uh, you know boy. Andy. Andy told me he's boy. actually coming over uh, in January and to going, your house, going what? to going to New York to see the oh, Washington yeah, game in I New saw York. That. I was like, Damn. yeah, him, and, yeah, him Better and Andy are going to stay with Keith, and they're going to uh, go to the. Oh game no, so. no, that's cool. That'll be fun. Stay in New Jersey. With Keith, <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I love Keith. Keith, Keith's terrible. a nice guy. I love. He's Keith. a great guy. Yeah, Scott's love. question for us is: Who yeah. goes first, Jack Del Rio, Scott Turner, or Dan Snyder? Ooh, I will go probably Jack Del Rio, just for the simple fact of the defense has been just so bad, and I know that uh, Ron has said he's been, been talking to Jack about more pressure, more blitzes, getting more like a exotic if you want to call it that but i just think that someone's got to go someone's got to be the scapegoat and you can still get the excuse of scott turner that he hasn't actually had a quarterback to run his offense he's had a bunch of eh. backups i'm yeah. not going to be bluntly honest with you yeah. he's had a bunch of backups running his offense so <laughs> at far. best yeah he's had he's had fits who's a, a justifiable starter for he had what two six plays throws? Yeah. yeah so like yeah. half of a quarter one quarter so <laughs> He hasn't really had an actual like, quarterback to run his offense. If I want to be bluntly honest again, he really hasn't had the weapons outside of Terry to really run his offense. Curtis Samuel's come here, been injured. Logan Thomas obviously has been a great surprise, but he's been injured this year. So, yeah, I would probably go Jack, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was Scott, but I'd definitely – if I had to push my chips in, I'd say Jack. If I will say it's going to be Scott Turner based on him getting a head coaching job. I've already seen his name floated around as people getting interviewed and stuff like that. So I'm not going to view this question as like them getting let go. I think this could be them leaving for another opportunity. So I, I think it would be Scott Turner. I don't think Jack Del Rio is going to be getting out of here, dude. The, there's Jack a reason. Del Rio's going to USC. There, there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason why Ron Rivera absolutely loves Jack Del Rio. Um, and they're they think similarly in the way of the game of football. Uh, so I think that Jack Rio is here to stay unless he gets a ho co head coach of Jeffrey USC. I mean, I think he would absolutely love that, obviously. He said in the past that that would be his uh, one of his dream jobs. Yeah, Kyle, Kyle you're such a half, glass half full kind of guy looking at it that way. But um, <laughs> no, I think if you look at it, I mean, I guess – Hall's got to be right. You kind of have to go with Del Rio just because there's so much expectations with this defense. Like there's, there's no excuse for this right now. Like, and unfortunately, if this continues, the blame has to fall on somebody like at least the offense, you can be like, well, they're starting Taylor Heineke, you know, like they're right. starting, like they're, they're done it. But this defense, there's no excuse. They have stars at every level and they have depth at every level and they're playing terrible. So uh, they have been getting better over the last couple of weeks. I will say that. But um, so unfortunately I love Jack Del Rio. I hope that he sticks around, but the blame would have to fall somewhere, and I would imagine it would be him. Um, but I'll tell you who's going to be fired for Urban Meyer is going to leave first, but it's not. He's going to pull a Nick Saban. He's just going to dip on the Jaguars to go either try to pick up young broads or just to, I don't know, go coach at USC. Watch. 
There. So, LSU's open up. He, so Scott, can go there. Scott's next question to us is is a, is a kind of like a little imaginary, if you got to imagine. So, imagine you are in a sealed room, and Scott wants to know, Reed, what is the biggest animal you think you could beat one on one in a sealed room? What type of animal could I beat up? Yeah, like that. We, oh. Each one of us could be you know, like the the biggest animal. <laughs> oh, do you want me to like assign who can beat up what? No, he's asking Just you me? what's the biggest oh. animal you could beat up in a sealed room. Fine. How big do animals get? That's a uh, honest question. Probably, on, seriously, like in all seriousness, right now, probably a silverback gorilla. I could beat the. Sh- I could destroy a silverback gorilla. I would murder that thing. Like they, people are all like, "Oh my god, they're so strong! Look at them! Look at all their muscles! Look at their!" We're gonna get canceled now because of Harambe, dude. Do you I think know. this is oh, funny? Uh, I have a Harambe shirt. Harambe, R.I.P. That's my guy. He's cool. That's awesome. But guess what? If it comes down to me or Harambe and we're in a room, I'm ripping those fangs out and I'm throwing bows straight to the eye. That guy's not gonna touch me. I don't care. You guys can say, "Oh, they're big and fast. They probably bench press about." 5,000 pounds, but guess what? I bench pressed 5,500 pounds, okay? So I would probably knock one out. No, I, I couldn't beat up anything, really. I'm not much of a fighter. Um, I'd get beat up by a lot. <laughs> I'd get beat up by a lot of things. Probably, Honestly, probably something, too, without arms, like a seal. Like, I feel like one of those would still <laughs> slap me around. Dude, I was about to say, I'll say a shark, just because if you're in a sealed room, it's probably just going to it's gonna die because it needs water right so i'll say yeah. shark eh. if you can survive for a couple minutes in yeah. that room yeah you're, you're golden that's smart kyle we're gonna Look need at a you. bigger boat yeah oh what about yeah. you who are you fighting bigfoot uh no nah. no you don't want to fight get... hemingway yeah. <laughs> no they wrap that thing around you no Most anaconda animals, dude probably. yep look honestly funny story really quick just to show you that any animal is probably going to beat me down Taking out the trash, I'm about to like leave for work today. Just taking stuff out to the dumpster in the back. All of a sudden, a huge rat the size of Master Splinter jumps out. Okay, well that's terrifying. Damn near he... attacks me, runs up my leg. I ran like a little girl, ran away screaming yeah. like ah. <laughs> scary. So that just goes to show you though, pretty much any animal is gonna take me down in the silver. I think about it though. He was saying, "Get off my block, cook." Pretty you... much, he was like, "What you doing at my house, cook?" He was as big as Master Splinter, and you're talking about fighting him. Do you know Master Splinter raised ninjas? He turned <laughs> turtles into ninjas. That's that true. guy's not losing. Master Splinter. So you have every right to be scared of that. And I actually it wasn't Master him. Splinter, just the size of Master Splinter. Well, I bet he can learn it like Master Splinter did. I mean, we all know that's a documentary. It's a documentary. <laughs> yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That's a real thing. That really happened. Google it. New York in the '80s. <laughs> New York in the '80s. <laughs> Um, yeah. Our next question is from our guy Jeff Miles. Uh, he wants to know who would you want to be the owners of the Washington Football Team to replace. But besides that, uh, like who would you want like the to replace the Snyder's? Uh, Pitbull. No, uh, <laughs> probably. DJ Khaled. <laughs> yeah, no. There's one the of the one five. of the. I gotta go with one of the Ted's, man. You know, uh, yeah. and I think we all know where I'm going with that one. But all right, everybody. Is. We are now joined by our all-star guest here, Mr. Washington Insider, Mr. Lake Lewis, returning back to us. How are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, what's up, fellas? How you doing? Doing fan. That, fan- that beard is looking crisp, Lake. Yeah, I'm growing it out. It's got a little long on nice. me. <laughs> Perfectly trimmed. Good for you. He, he got it all scheduled up for uh, Fitzpatrick's return, apparently, is what I see. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's thick, man. It is. I might trim it down soon. <laughs> and now, Lake, this is a big game coming up this week, going against the Green Bay Packers there in Lambeau. Uh, but the Washington football team injury report, it's a long one, my friend. So if you can, can you kind of update us on who's in and who's out for the game against the Packers? I mean, it's going to be a lot of guys that come down to some game time decisions. I know, you know, they're listed as DMP sometimes as far as didn't practice or limited. But say, for instance, Terry McLaurin, who's been, you know, DMP in practice or limited, you know, he's going to play. So um, he's just one of those guys that obviously they if he doesn't play, there's no shot for them to do anything. Um, So he'll play. Um, you know, Antonio Gibson's been banged up, but he miraculously plays on Sundays as well. I know, yeah, I don't know how. I, I've had yeah. those shin splints are terrible. Yeah, I've had shin splints too my whole <laughs> life. And it, it, it's definitely a painful thing, but, yeah. you know, you, you rest it, you ice it, um, maybe you cortisone it, <laughs> you know, for, for, for the game. Um, so I, I'd be surprised if he, if he didn't go per se. 
um, the list is, is fluid. I mean, it changes so rapidly, guys. It is hard for me to come on here and say who I know verbatim, mm. you know, will be out. Now, Curtis Samuel, you know, that's a name that everybody asks. I don't see him playing. Um, you know, as far as the uh, injury report listed as, you know, questionable, um, I probably would say more doubtful than anything else. Um, you know, he's just not right right now. And he's not practicing at all. We're out there every day and, you know, he's not practicing. So with that being said, it's hard for me to believe that a guy in his situation who hasn't, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, taken snaps in practice, you're going to throw him out there and just hope you're catching lightning in a bottle. I mean, there's another mm -hmm. player that's out there that's serviceable, you know, so you have to hope maybe Deami Brown, who's back, you know, in the mix that, you know, he's a guy that can continue to develop and grow and they can utilize his strengths. I mean, you know, they have him lot, running a lot of crossing routes. I mean, he's a, he's a North South type of receiver and he had the one opportunity, you know, where, you know, it was a 50, 50 ball. I, I think in, you know, in the practices, he catches that he didn't catch it in the game, mm -hmm. but it's not a drop. It's just a tough play to make. So hopefully they can get him some more opportunities like that to make a play because they're going to have to make many plays in order to beat the Packers. Now, how did, how did Terry look at practice today? I did see a video and somebody was uh, speculating that he didn't look that great with that hammy. No, he didn't look great, but he's still, you know, at, at 70% is better than any other option, yeah. <laughs> you know, that he had, right? you know, and, and he's a guy that once the game starts, you know, you don't see him favoring it. I mean, it was the same thing last week, you know, and then he came out and he, you know, he moved around pretty well. Um, you know, he had a couple drops and obviously I think those are concentration things more than anything else, just pressing to make a play. Um, but, but again, I think he'll be out there and I think he'll be effective you know, it, it, it's something about when you lose, and I'm not saying guys are tanking it. I'm not saying that, but but I do know human nature is when you're not winning, why rush my body back out there? Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's just human nature. Yeah. If this team, you know, had a, a record of four and two as opposed to two and four, I, I guarantee you some of these injuries would would guys would be playing on those injuries. So it, it's yeah. just something to be said. Right, right. You know, sticking with the offense, um, Taylor Heineke obviously comes in, starts against the Giants week two, gets out to a hot start, uh, gets the W against the Giants, even though it was kind of, uh, what do you want to call it, uh, skeptical with the whole field goal situation <laughs> at the end of the game. Right, right. But with that being said, he's kind of had some down games these past couple of weeks. What's been your assessment of him so far throughout the season? I just think teams have started game planning them. You know, they started figuring out his tendencies and – you know, let's call it like it is, you know, no one likes to say it, but he's a gunslinger. I mean, he, he's a, he's a, he's yep. a gambler. He's a guy that, that forces the action. It works sometimes. And sometimes it, it, it obviously doesn't. It, it, it hasn't necessarily worked over the last two weeks. I mean, he's thrown what, two, three interceptions. And, you know, you, you can't turn the football over when you're a team that's struggling, especially on the defensive side of the ball. You don't want to keep giving the defense, you know, when they hit the field, they have, you know, a shortened field on them because we're talking about upper echelon offenses and, and elite quarterbacks that they're playing now, you know, doesn't get any easier this week with Aaron Rodgers. If you, you know, turn the ball over on your own side of the field, it, it mean, it's going to be tough sledding for them. So they're going to have to be able to sustain drives. And one thing I will say, guys, is I don't want to put everything on Taylor. I think that I do. I think that this football team needs to run the football a lot more than what they yeah. have. I don't care if it's by committee, um, you know, have, get get Jared Patterson involved. You know, they need to really find a way to stay in a rhythm because when they've run the ball, it's actually been effective. You know, they haven't had the big home run run, but they've had six yard carries, seven yard carries. I think J.D. McKissick definitely warrants touching the football a lot more in this offense. Um, you know, and that'll take the pressure off Gibson if he's playing on the shin splits. Jared Patterson should be a guy that should be getting in the game. You know, even if he's touching the ball five times, you know, you need to get this running game going. It takes pressure off the offensive lineman having to pass block the whole game. And more importantly, it takes the ball out of Taylor Heineke's hands to always have to be a miracle worker because that's not what he is. Right, right. Yeah. So, so switching sides, obviously, uh, the defense as a whole, really, we all know they have not lived up to expectations, the huge expectations that they had this offseason. 
But uh, specifically, William Jackson the third has really struggled. I mean, it, and it's so disappointing because we all know how good he can be. We've seen glimpses of it. We saw it in Cincinnati for that one season, 2017. He was amazing. Um, how do you think he can break out of this slump, or is this just kind of who he is? You know, it when you get in a when you get in a slump, it, it is hard to come out of, it. especially as a corner. Well, especially also when you you haven't had any success in this defense at all. Right. Mm-hmm. So it'd be one thing if he was in Cincinnati, where you know he he was an elite type corner, uh, but he was a cover corner. You know, I think the problem is is that it, it, you're seeing him get a lot more action now, which is actually not a bad thing. You know, right. yeah, he's gotten beat on some plays, but that's okay. He's getting some action, and that's him being a cover corner. When they have him in a zone, that's something he never played in Cincinnati. And for the life of me, I still don't understand why they paid him all this money to bring him here to fit, a, you know, a, what do they call it, a square and a round hole or something. Right. You know, it just doesn't – you got a guy that you know is a cover corner. Let him play his game. And uh, I thought I saw last year Ronald Darby play more man coverage <laughs> than William Jackson is this yeah. year. So they're just getting away from what worked for them last year. You know, everybody knows that Cam Curl's not a free safety. He's a strong safety. Mm -hmm. And by, you know, moving Landon Collins into the box, (laughs) which Ron Rivera won't call linebacker, let's call it he's a linebacker. (laughs) Um, You know, hopefully that helps Cam Curl on the back end as well, which will help William Jackson. So it's it's moving parts here, guys. And, And unfortunately, they just, I don't know. I, I just feel like these these coaches aren't putting guys like William Jackson in position to really play their their true games, they're, where they can't play fast, but they're back there thinking at all times. Right, yeah. and then that's what I was. I'm sorry, Kyle. Just to branch off of that, so you don't think you don't think that this is necessarily just because of the certain situations that they've been placed in because the team's been behind or or whatever. This is just kind of the coaching staff just hasn't been putting them in the right positions to make plays. Yeah, it's schematics. I mean, listen. Um, guys don't they don't want to hear it I mean Ron Rivera you know he, he he's an accredited coach I mean he's a guy that's had success but I say this before last time I looked he never won a Super Bowl <laughs> so so you can't keep saying do things the right way do things the right way as if your way is the blueprint on the right way you didn't win a Super Bowl so your way needs to be tampered to become the right way somehow so it's not just the players that have to do things the right do things the right way the coaches do and that's called getting your players in positions to make plays it, it just seems like far too often we've seen with this this team this organization they sign free agents and those free agents look nothing like what what we thought they were bringing in and you can't tell me that before you know Bobby McCain and, and William Jackson were brought over you're thinking my God they're gonna just make a, a, a young defense that much better Mm -hmm. it just looks like everyone's regressed it looks like chase young when he came in here last year he was still an ohio state product and now that he's been coached for one year what has he been coached he's doing the same move that goes back to coaching at the end of the day i mean he looks like ryan kerrigan on the edge now right (laughs) you know just bull rush ahead and everyone runs underneath him so they've got to figure out some stuff you know i'd like to see him and montez switch often not just you know once a game i'd like to see them switch every other series switch opposite sides of the field you know send some blitzes send jamon davis up the middle he can run so if he can run why is he not being put in position to show his speed it's just again coaches thinking that they know more than everybody else out there and unfortunately that's not always the case yeah and then washington made headline news this week um for different reasons than previous weeks but they let go of Dustin Hopkins and they signed Chris Blewett, who has I not, did not kicked think that's where you were going and has not kicked in the <laughs> NFL uh, yet. And he hasn't kicked since 2016, since he was at University of Pittsburgh. Did you agree with the move of letting go of um, Dustin Hopkins? And how, absolutely cons- not. how concerned are you with Chris Blewett? Yeah, absolutely not. Was I did I agree with that? Um, I think it was a dumb move. And I, and I can flat out say that. If you were going to get rid of Dustin Hopkins, you should have done that a couple of weeks ago, you know, but again, don't come back and tell us that that's your guy. Don't come back and tell us a week ago, where are you going to find something better? <laughs> you know, that's out there. So you're telling me what you found better is a guy that's never kicked in an NFL game. Whose that, last name you know, is Blewett. 
Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not knocking the player because hopefully he does well, you know. But in order for him to do well and this move be justified, he's got to kick more than 85 percent, mm. and that's tough for an NFL kicker in today's climate. Dustin Hopkins' career average was 84 percent. I don't want to hear people keep telling me on social media that he was inconsistent or, I mean, he was, he only missed two field goals this year. I mean, he was 12 for 14. That's not bad. And let's put it this way. 12 for 14 with an offense does not really move in the ball. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you may say it's more pressure on him to get those three points, but, but when Ron Rivera sat in front of us and said that the, the field goal that Dustin missed against the, 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 the chiefs, you know, was a momentum swing. They still were losing that football game. Stop it. You know, stop making it sound like that's what cost us the game. And then the Chiefs went on this run. They were going to get you regardless if Dustin Hopkins was in uniform or not. So let's not fool ourselves here. So you, you, you get rid of a kicker that's been pretty solid for most of his career. Yeah, he's in a slump. But one thing I have I've come to learn in the NFL kickers who've been in the league more than five years everyone has a slump after they get that out their system they go on to to really lofty heights all you have to do is look at Graham Gano mm. you remember his time here he struggled he struggled they move on from him after a couple of years he goes you know elsewhere and look at breaks an NFL record mm. and, and you saw that on display up close <laughs> when they played the Panthers you know he just doesn't miss so again, I just think Dustin Hopkins was the least of your concerns. If you're worrying about three points here or there, uh, you got problems. <laughs> your offense needs to get seven, not three. Agreed. Yeah, totally agree. And sticking with the office or sticking with the team as a whole, jumping to this game on Sunday. Uh, speaking of offense, Green Bay has a pretty high powered offense. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers, first ballot Hall of Famer, top three quarterback in the league. Devontae Adams, arguably the best receiver in the league and a deadly guy that's a kind of a dual threat in Aaron Jones. Um, if there was going to be a path to victory for Washington, I know it's a slim path to victory, but what, what would be a path to victory if they were going to pull this one out on Sunday? I mean, we've been saying it for what? <laughs> this will be the seventh week is defense. The defense has to play up to their potential. Everyone knew that the defense was going to have to carry this football team, but because they haven't done their part, they, they can't win games. The offense has done okay. You know, my, my concern isn't on the offensive side of the ball at all. I mean, they've, they've put up enough points and sustained some decent enough drives that the defense, you know, can do their part. You know, I know guys in that locker room may say, well, we got an interception last week early, you know, the Bobby McCain interception. All four of us, five of us here could have caught that. <laughs> you know, Patrick yeah. Mahomes threw it straight in the air. What was he thinking? Yeah. That had to have been caught. I mean, if Bobby McCain dropped that, then we really would be talking about that. Right. Okay. So with that said, I want to see the tight coverage where you're picking off a pass from Aaron Rodgers to Devontae Adams. You know, you're picking off a pass from Aaron Rodgers to Randall Cobb or someone underneath. Make a play. Don't let the play be made for you. So uh, again, if, in order for them to win this game, they're going to have to somehow, some way, slow this Packers offense down and, and make it a close football game. And every time they play Green Bay, especially in Green Bay, you know, fortunately, they play them tough in Green Bay. There have been some really, really dog fights up there. I'm not saying that this is necessarily going to be a dog fight. But I, I just don't see this team getting smoked up in the Green Bay. I don't see them going in there and just getting totally wiped out. Um, I, I, I think that there's some things that, that are starting to come together a little bit. But this is one of those things, and I tweeted this out earlier today, guys. Is this a must win? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it's the closest thing there is. Wow. So if you can't get up for this game and make it close and make it a tight game, we may not have a chance to predict they're going to win another game this year. Yeah, and then one player that also made headlines was Landon Collins. Uh, Ron Rivera and his presser talked about how they had a conversation and he felt that he should be the in-the-box kind of defender, uh, run defending and blitzing. So are you confident that Landon Collins can bounce back in this new form in this defense? I mean, he's going to have to. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think. How long, how long of a leash do you think he has, essentially? 
with Rivera. Listen, and I and I wrote this, and and one thing I will say about Landon, he is a nice guy. He he he, he truly is. He's a stand up guy. He doesn't duck questions. He he knows he's been struggling on the back end, but that's not his game. His game is close to the line of scrimmage. I, I kind of don't like the way the teams handled this. And again, not to come on your show and be negative, guys, but it's been, a lot, it's been a lot of reasons to be negative. And my thing is, he's a strong safety. You knew when you brought him in from the Giants, you knew he was a guy that played close to the box. They were trying to revert him to the Landon Collins of 2016, where he had five interceptions and four sacks. It was, it was just an incredible year. But he's never had more than two in a season ever since. That's not his game. He's a tackler. He's a guy that will come up and force fumbles. He makes plays around the line of scrimmage. You still can play him a strong safety and do that. So now they're going to try to make him this hybrid linebacker, you know, slash safety, kind of like a Mark Barron was a couple of years back. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. But don't placate us in the media because one thing with us in the media, the guys who cover this team when we sit out there, we know when we're being duped. <laughs> we know when 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 something's not not being forthright. And I don't think Ron Rivera's been forthright about the Landon Collins situation. You know, just to use the word downhill, to use the word in the box. Come on, guys. It's called linebacker. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to say that because Landon doesn't want to be a linebacker. Landon made that very clear to us. You know, I posted posted the video, you know, and he said, I don't want to play linebacker. I don't want to have to get off big guards and things like that. Big linemen. So anyway, um, I, I don't know. I think they're looking to see what they have in the guy personally. You know, I think they're going to evaluate this, you know, this year because he's making a lot of money to not be productive. So hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, they can find something to bring out the guy that they thought they were going to sign. Um, but I just know playing, you know, too deep, you know, on a cover two is not his game. So, so you figure this out in week seven, <laughs> it just, it doesn't add up. It just doesn't add up at all. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned the coaching staff earlier and uh, how they should be putting the uh, players in better positions to succeed. Um, Scott Turner, the offense kind of looks similar to what the Alex Smith was last year. Do you think it's fair to kind of assess Scott Turner up to this point, knowing that he really hasn't had that that quarterback to kind of step in and kind of be that uh, the guy that sparks the offense? Uh, I, th- I think he's done some things well. He has. But I also think there's some things that he if he could get back, he would. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, he abandons the run, you know, and that in this day and age of high powered offenses, quarterback slinging the ball over the field. It's one thing to do that. It's one thing to have the quarterback to do that. <laughs> and they don't have the quarterback that can do that on the roster, period. <laughs> and and so they have, he has to be really creative, but the gimmicky stuff, people are starting to figure it out. You know, there's a time where you just have to line up and go forward. And there was a time last week where they had a, a, a third and two, and then it got to be fourth and two. And they're throwing bubble screens. You know, they're they're not, they're just not, they're not being aggressive enough, you know, go downfield. There was a play that I think the ball was overthrown to, I want to say Terry McLaurin. Uh, And, and then you go back the next play and you throw a bubble screen. (laughs) Just those plays after a while, teams know your formations and they see that that's what you're doing. And that's to be safe with Taylor Heineke. But I think when you, when you, when you put Taylor Heineke in a box, that's when he plays poorly. You know, and they keep saying ball protect, ball protect. Listen, if he throws an interception or makes a mistake because he's trying to make a play, I'd I'd rather live with that than him throwing an interception stuck in the box. Um, You know, he makes plays with his legs, and you guys can clearly see they're telling him not to run at times. Mm -hmm. Listen, that's like telling – he's not Lamar Jackson, of course, but that's like telling a guy that can move, you know, Lamar – Kyler Murray. I mean, those guys make plays with their legs. And, and Taylor Heineke is a guy that can make plays with his legs. We've seen that with our own eyes. Yeah. So don't put him in the pocket and make him a pocket quarterback because he's not that. Right. Yeah. So obviously right now, Washington sits at two and four. And more than likely after this week, I mean, if we're being honest with ourselves, they're going to be two and five. What is the rest of the season outlook for Washington? I mean, do the wall do the wheels just completely fall off after this with, with all the things going on? Or do you think that there's still a glimmer of hope? that this Washington team can get things turned around with all the talent that they have. 
See, I would say there would be a glimmer of hope if the Cowboys weren't playing the way they are. Right, right. Bottom yeah. line is Dallas looks really They're good. On both sides of the <laughs> ball. Absolutely. They look really good, and they're only going to get better. I mean, they've got a new nucleus of players that are still learning each other. Right. Um, it, you know, so it, the, the chances of you making the playoffs are almost nil because you have to win this division in order to get in because of what's going on out in the NFC West. You've got a couple teams in the NFC North that have, you know, you know, possibilities. Minnesota's coming on, you know, so you already know about Green Bay. Um, this is just going to be, to me, it's going to be a tough year. And it just happens to fall on a year where there's really no quarterback that just jumps off the charts that they possibly yeah. be in contention to draft. So, Hey, maybe if everyone wants to make light out of this game, maybe they're watching Aaron Rodgers, and maybe he's watching this roster to see how far is it away from me joining it to be like a Tom Brady Buccaneer type situation. Ron Rivera and Aaron Rodgers, two cow guys. That connection is there. Hopefully that hometown feel can if I'm Ron Rivera, I'm wearing a cow shirt under my uh, yeah. under my coat, and I'm gonna show it to Aaron Rodgers every chance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Now to, yeah. wrap, to wrap this up, Lake, I have a, a couple questions for you. The first one being, we talked about earlier with Antonio Gibson with the shin splints and everything. Do you think that he will be okay for Sunday? I think he plays. I do. I do. Um, I didn't hear anything late. Um, I didn't get a chance to see the the last report um, that went out at the end of the day. Um, but I, again, I've seen him do this and, you know, he plays on Sunday. He's a tough kid. You know, there's one thing you can say about him. I'm not sure if Antonio is really the featured back that this team needs long-term. You know, I think he's a good back. I think he'd be a nice complimentary back, but I'm not sure if he's that, that home run, you give it to him and you hold your breath because something can happen. You know, the, you look at the kid in Texas, you know, Robinson, you can just see that he so has good. he has vision and he and he's just a natural runner. He's like a mini AP. Almost. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so you see those guys. He reminds me of Reggie Bush too. You know, yeah, but yeah. but with but with Gibson, you, you can tell he's learning how to play running back. And the problem is, this is the pros. <laughs> so people don't yeah. have time to wait for that. Um, you know, again, if he had a ridiculous line, you know, that could be another story. But I still, I just, I think he's a good running back, but. I don't know if they have their featured running back that they need in this offense. And then my next question to you, uh, Sam Cosme and Brandon Sheriff, who is going to come back first if you had to predict? Uh, I would say Cosme. Okay, great. I definitely would say, yeah, I definitely would say Cosme. And, um, you know, I'm the same guy that said this too, you know, uh, and I'll say it again, not to speculate, but just, you know, you, you see, uh, <laughs> you see Cornelius Lucas back out, you know, um, a tackle and you obviously Leno on the other side. Um, I, I kind of think Cosme might be a guy next year that moves inside and replaces Brandon. Cause I don't know if Brandon's going to be here. I don't think he will be. Yeah. I don't think he will be either. So that might be look right there <laughs> now. And then my, to wrap this up, my last question to you, what's your prediction for the game and an MVP either team? Man, it's going to be a tough one here. Uh, you know, the, the, I always try to be honest with you guys. You know, I, I don't see them beating Green Bay and Green Bay, but I don't see Green Bay blowing this team out. Mm. You know, I think we're looking at like a 27, 26, maybe Green Bay. I, I, I'll say Green Bay 26, Washington 17. Um, you know, I think Green Bay pulls away in the fourth, you know, just too much talent and, a, and an elite quarterback, you know. Um, MVP of the game, I'm going to go Aaron Jones. I just think mm -hmm. that, you know, everybody's going to focus on Rodgers and, and Devontae Adams, you know, in the passing game, um, you know, Valdez, Scanlon and all these guys, you know, but at the end of the day, you run the football, you win. And that's what happens in the fourth quarter. You know, I think this defense is going to be on the field quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So they may wear down and that's when green Bay, you know, takes the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hand and just runs the ball. So uh, I'm going to go Aaron Jones, MVP, green Bay, 26, Washington, 17. Such a smart pick by you. Cause you know, they love to throw uh, him out of the backfield and we've been struggling to do that. Uh, Lake, I can't thank you enough for joining us again. Um, if you real quick, just in case there's anybody watching that doesn't know where to follow you on social media and uh, your other shows. Uh, you can follow me on social media on Twitter, Lake Lewis, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Lake Lewis Jr. Uh, you can follow us on uh, sportsjourney.com. And, uh, and then you can follow me on my podcast, uh, After Practice uh, Podcast. 
So yes, I appreciate sir. you guys having me on as always. Of course. Thank you yes. so much, Thank Lake. You, you are the yeah. man, dude. You are great. Goat. Appreciate it, guys. Have, have a good, good night, weekend. Lake. Hopefully they get oh, a win. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Have a good one, Lake. <laughs> All right. Take care, guys. All right, everybody. We just spoke with the legend, Mr. Lake Lewis himself. Now to wrap the up man. this to, now to wrap up yeah. this episode, let's go in with our predictions, okay? And I wanted also to um to say what everyone's predictions were that they sent in. So Hall, if you want to go first, what are your predictions for the game and what who is going to be the MVP? Um I keep saying that Washington wins a game every year. They have no business winning. Even if you go back to the Kirk Cousins years up in Seattle with Josh Oxen being the number one receiver, reigning game, they win that. You go back to even last year, 11-0, and Pittsburgh coming in. Everyone gave us no shot. We come away with that W. I said I thought that uh, last week we kind of – I didn't think they were going to win that game. I thought they would hang. Um, defense kind of turning corners. Unfortunately, I don't – I wouldn't be surprised if they somehow pulled this out with all the crazy stuff going on this week. But I just – my heart – Wants them to win. My mind is telling me. My Packers mind is this. telling me no. But my body. <laughs> hey, but look, Packers win this sing game. That monster song. <laughs> yeah. Trying to get canceled. Netflix. Right now. Yeah. Um, well, you're I getting Packers. us canceled, Kyle. Well, I don't yeah. even know what you're talking about right now. R. Kelly. It, he's like, oh, I didn't even. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> even put two, two together. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus. Um, um, yeah. Um, Packers. I got them winning this game. I'm kind of along the lines of Lake. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it'll be close. I'll go Packers 27, Washington 22. MVP. Oh, MVP. Uh, we'll go. I'm with Lake. I think that Aaron Jones has a pretty big day. I think he goes over 100 and, 110 scrimmage yards on us, mostly out the backfield because, again, we kind of struggle to cover those back out the backfield. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good pick. Um, I was on Andy's, on the DC Tweet Team podcast on Wednesday. I picked 30-24 to 24 that Washington will win this game, and I'm still sticking to that. I believe that this Washington team, like Lake Lewis said, they play well up in Green Bay. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Mike, it's, it's Lomb, Vince Lombardi. It's His the spirit, cheese. Vince Lombardi coming back and helping us, you know, a little bit yeah. up in Green Bay, having that home field advantage. But our next, uh, one of the submissions that we had sent in was formerly washington wolves on twitter and he his prediction is green bay wins 42 to 17 i love your optimism brother that's a a great great one (laughs) real real fast real fast i I gotta take out james just woke up i gotta take off okay bye all right bye everybody we're gonna lose that's my prediction all right great all right now our next question our next prediction was from adam moore he said he thinks washington's gonna win 30 to 27 the new kicker gets the win. Blew it MVP of the game. That, that's well, another one I told you it was a common theme. That would be the irony of this week where everyone's getting on Ron and everyone going crazy about Dustin Hopkins. And I'm glad he's gone. And other people are, what are you doing? Would it be, like I said, the irony of Chris Blewett coming in and kicking a 50-plus yard field goal, something that Dustin Hopkins couldn't do? Right. And now uh, the next submission was from Ty T Mac on Twitter. He put 10 to 31, the pack win, but JD McKissick is the MVP of the game. I could easily see that being the case with them kind of respecting the pass game with Terry McLaurin, and everything telling him, make us make run the ball and hit, hit your check downs. I think they're going to force Taylor into those. Uh, definitely. Now our next one was from big Doug. He says the Washington football team is going to win 27 to 23. Look at the optimism, Doug. A couple weeks ago, you weren't picking him. Now look at you. My man. (laughs) And he said, Terry has two touchdowns. Terry is his MVP. I love that. And then our guy, Tim Meek, uh, he from Indy Skins fan. Everyone knows Tim Meek. He was a huge Skins fan. And uh, he wants, he says, 23 to 20, Skins win, four sacks on Rodgers, and they force a turnover. Zero turnovers for the offense. Red zone and third down efficiency better than the opponent. And he said, my God, this new kicker better not blew it. Uh, I like that, Tim. (laughs) That's that's a good send-off You talk about optimism. That is some optimism right there. Yes, it is. All right, everybody. I want to thank everyone for coming on. Did I say who my MVP was? Uh, I don't think. Oh no, I don't think you did. I said so. uh, Yeah, thirty to twenty-four. I think Washington wins. That they get the victory. They just play well up there. And I think the MVP could very well be Diami Brown. Um, just because of what's going on with Terry McLaurin, I wouldn't be surprised if Ricky Seals Jones has a great game as well, getting that underneath coverage. 
But if they're going to win this football game 30-24, to they're going to need some deep downfield play. And I know Terry is there, but if I'm Green Bay and Joe Barry, I'm just going to bracket Terry all day and say beat us with your other guys. And that's why I think Diami Brown's going to have a really, really big game. All right, Hopefully. everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I hope everyone has a great weekend. I hope we get this victory on Sunday. All right, everybody. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. We'll see you guys next time. We'll see you on Monday. Washington football. Woo! Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle. I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. And if you liked what you saw, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you get notified when anything new is uploaded to the channel. Also, we just launched theburgundyzone.com. You can go there and find all of our latest news, articles, and the latest episodes that are uploaded. Again, we also have the Discord chat server, where all of our VIP folks are in, like Andy Burroughs, Scott Hartley, Sergio Martin is in there as well. Don't miss out on the Discord chat server. Go and check that out. Until next time, everybody, Washington football. Woo!